Hello everyone, I'm Joel Ivy Johnson and I just got my hands on an NVIDIA Jetson Nano. Uh, I wanted to give you a close-up view of the board along with talking about some of the accessories that you'll probably want to get with it and what some of your case options are. Uh, at the time that I ordered mine, they were new. NVIDIA has said that they'd ship these at the end of April and they actually shipped them at the beginning. So there wasn't very much information available about what I would need ahead of time. Uh, if I knew then what I knew now, I would have gone ahead and just ordered all of my accessories up front because when the board originally came, I actually didn't have everything I needed to get it up and running. And I would have gone ahead and ordered those accessories I needed so that at day one, I would have been ready to go uh, full steam ahead in it. Now, in this video, I only talk about the board itself and give you some physical close-ups. By the end of the video, the board will be up and running, but it's in a future video that I'll get into talking about software development with the Jetson Nano. So the Jetson Nano was one of many uh, boards in the Jetson line that NVIDIA makes, There's many others, but the Nano is the least expensive of these boards. It's available for just $99. The uh, other Jetson boards, I think, start around $300 and just go up from there. Uh, the Jetson Nano comes with 128 CUDA cores. I'm not going to get into very much detail about what CUDA cores are in this video, but just take note that it uh, provides a pretty good uh, environment for experimenting around with some parallel computing. Let's talk about what's inside the box. In the box is a Jetson Nano, pre-mounted on a carrier board. Uh, there's a cardboard stand and there is a getting started insert. And the getting started insert will direct you to one of the web, one of the NVIDIA development websites uh, where you can download the firmware and find other documentation on a board. Now inside the box there's not enough to turn it on from day one, but if you already have a Raspberry Pi, then chances are you already have everything that you need. You could just go and take it from your Raspberry Pi. Uh, but just in case, I'm going to make the assumption that you don't have a Raspberry Pi and you don't have any of the other accessories that you need. Now the uh, insert itself gives you a pretty good idea of some of the things that you're going to need for the board. Uh, you're going to need to have an SD memory card. It needs to be at least 16 gigabytes or larger. You want to have a keyboard and a mouse in order to plug into the board. You'll need to have a display and either a display port or an HDMI cable, depending on what type of display that you have. Now, if you have both an HDMI and a display uh, port display, you can connect the Jetson Nano to both of them at once. It will work with both of them at the same time and you'll be able to simultaneously output video to either one. Now to get it set up, you also need to have a PC running either Windows or Mac OS or Linux, and the computer needs to have an SD card reader. A lot of modern computers don't have SD card readers in them, so you might need to go out and buy one or borrow one. Power supply is one of the most important components. When I first got mine, I tried to just use one of my cell phone chargers. That didn't work out so well. NVIDIA specifically says that you need to have a power supply that outputs at least 2.5 amps. The first one I started with would not output that much, and at first things seemed to be fine. I was able to start up the Nano, I was able to get through the startup process, get everything set up, but then it would randomly just turn off on me. I had no idea what was going on until I finally put on my USB power meter so that I could start looking at the voltage, the current, and some other things. And I saw that whenever my power supply meets its maximum current, the uh, NVIDIA Jetson would just cut off. Uh, basically what was going on when the Jetson could not get enough current, that's just how it reacts. There's no error message, there's nothing, you just see the power light on it turn off. And that's all it does. So you want to make sure that you actually have a power supply that's capable of outputting enough. Like I said, five volts, 2.5 amps. Adafruit has some power supplies that are that meet these specs. I went ahead and purchased one. These are available on Amazon. Uh, the links for everything that I mentioned are also in the video description below. And uh, just an FYI, these are affiliate links. But go ahead and make sure that you have a 2.5 amp power supply. Don't try and uh, get by with one that runs less than that. It'll just cause a lot of headaches and a lot of problems for you to figure out and you can just circumvent all of that if you get something that needs spec. So setup is easy. Let's take a look at the board. Uh, when we start off by looking at the ports of the board from left to right, uh, there's a barrel jack connector. You see uh, the stacked video connectors with display port on top and the HDMI below it. There are three USB 3.0 ports and then there's an Ethernet adapter. The Ethernet adapter is a gigabit Ethernet adapter. And right next to that is a micro USB port. Uh, the micro USB port is only used for powering the device. 
Now the barrel jack connector can also be used for powering the device, but if you use that, there's a jumper that you have to set. Until then, the Jetson now just kind of ignores that port. Once you set that jumper, it will use the barrel jack to get power, and then it will ignore the USB port. So you can use one or the other, but uh, you can't use both. If you want to switch back and forth between them, you have to make a switch to attach to that jumper so that you can select which network or power supply to use. Now when you look down on a board from over here, the view is going to be dominated from by the heat sink. Now, part of the wires in the picture of the one that I have here. I've already installed my wireless network card and the wires that you see here are for the antennas. Uh, you would not see that on your board. Uh, but the top of the heat sink, you can see there's some holes on there. That's for mounting a 40 millimeter fan. Uh, the fan is also something that's optional. I went ahead and put one on mine, but it's not something that's strictly necessary. And if you look just behind the uh, gigabit Ethernet adapter, you can see the connector where you put the where you'd be able to attach the fan. Now I ordered my I also ordered my fan from Amazon. The link to the one that I used is in the description, but just an FYI, that one does not ship with any screws. So you need to already have some screws for it. But if you don't have any screws and if you're in a pinch, I originally had mine attached with a couple of pieces of scotch tape just to hold it in place temporarily. And it actually held it in place pretty well until I was finally able to find some screws that would fit. Now, the, the Jetson module is attached to the carrier board and held in place with a couple of screws. If I remove those two screws and uh, pull back in the retaining clip so I can take the module out. And so when I take the module out and turn it over, then you can see the underside of the Jetson Nano and this shows you where the memory card slot is. And here I have a 64 gig SanDisk card in mine now. So here's a carrier board again with a wireless network card installed on it. If you look on the edge of the board, you can see that there's a 40 pin header there. Uh, the 40 pin header has the exact same pinout as the Raspberry Pi. As a matter of fact, you can use some of the Raspberry Pi hats with the board. It will just work with them. I don't think there's 100% compatibility, but there's a good bit of Raspberry, raspberry Pi hardware that you can get to work on there. Uh, it has the exact same pinout. You'll also notice that there's a camera connector that looks very much like the one that you find on the Raspberry Pi. The Raspberry Pi camera can also be installed into the Jetson Nano and it will work here. If you ever need to know the purpose of any one of the pins that's on the Jetson Nano, you can usually look on the underside of the board and you can see the pins labeled there. Some of the pins are labeled on the top, but they're also labeled underneath. One interesting thing to note is when you look on the underside of the board where the micro USB port is, uh, on the silk screen, there's some notation there. It says USB-C and micro USB. So it looks like Nvidia has thought ahead and they might have a version of the board out in the future that's able to accept USB-C. Now up in the corner of the board, uh, close to the 40 pin header, there's four other pins. Uh, according to the documentation, this is for power over Ethernet, uh, but there's not very much information on them, so I haven't bothered to touch those. I'm going to keep an eye out for more information on them. On the opposite side of the board from the Raspberry Pi headers, you'll find a few other headers. One of them is a 6 pin UART, so if you need to attach a serial device to the board, uh, this is where you'd be able to uh, make that interface. Next to the UART, you also find four pairs of headers. Each one of these headers uh, has something to do with power. Whenever you put a jumper or a switch across them, each one of them has a specific purpose. Uh, one of them is for a reset button. Also, by default, whenever you, the Jetson Nano first gets power, it'll go ahead and power on. If you don't like that behavior, then you can also short one of these other sets of pins and it will only have a turn on whenever a power button is pressed. So one of the other pairs on there is for attaching a power button. And then the last pair is for doing a full and complete reset on the board. I haven't tested those out uh, since the OS image was written to an SD card. I kind of feel like if you want to do a full reset that you'd be able to just rewrite to that SD card. But there may be some other settings that are, are stored uh, in places other than the card. And so that would be how you go about resetting them. Now basically you would short those two pins and then attach power and it will go about doing a reset. Now also underneath the board, there's a connector for what, where it looks like a battery could be installed. I couldn't find any documentation on what this would do. I speculate that maybe sometime in the future they might add a real-time clock and you'd be able to attach a battery in order to keep the clock going. But as of yet, there's not any documentation that's available on it. The setup process is the same as Raspberry Pi. I just select the image, and I select the card I want to write to, and then I hit flash. 
It takes a few minutes, but when all is said and done, all I have to do is take the SD card and then insert it into the Jetson Nano, and it's ready to go. So that's what the board looks like and everything that you need to set up. And if you missed it, once again, the board setup is just nothing more than writing an image to an SD card, putting it inside of the Jetson Nano and turning it on and it'll walk you through the rest of the rest of the steps. Now, I didn't want to turn on my Nano without a case. Uh, for my Raspberry Pi, for my Arduino, for any of my other boards, I go ahead and I put those inside of the case simply because I don't like having the electrical contacts exposed. I wouldn't take very much for a screwdriver on a desk or even if you're wearing a wedding ring to like short a couple of those pins out. In a best case scenario that might just reset the device, but in a worst case scenario that could also damage some devices. So I went to shopping for a case for mine. I was able to find three notable cases. Well, I was only able to find three cases. There's not any that you can buy off the shelf at this time, so all the cases that I found are really planned for cases that you can 3D print. So if you don't have a 3D printer, you can also send those off to a 3D printing service. 3D Hubs is one. But you might also want to check and see if you have any local 3D printing services or see if you have any lo local maker spaces that have a 3D printer because you might be able to find a better price on them. One of the cases I was able to find is called the Nano Case. Now it just fully envelopes the Jetson Nano itself, but it also leaves the heat sink exposed on it. So from a cooling pr perspective, that's good. Uh, it also looks like if you wanted to go ahead and attach a cooling fan on there, you'd be able to still do that. But just keep in mind that the cooling fan is outside the case and so it would not have the same protection as everything else. Another notable case is from a company called Connect Tech. They call their case the Nano Pack, and you can download the design files from it directly from their site. The fully envelopes the Nano. Uh, I thought this was a good case, so I went ahead and I got one printed out. But ultimately I didn't end up using it. So. Right now, I still have an extra case. I could toss it, or I think I'll just hold on to it until I get another Jetson Nano, which is a possibility. The case I ultimately went with was uh, one called the Nano Mesh. Uh, as the name suggests, the Nano Mesh has a mesh on it on the top and the bottom, so it allows plenty of airflow to go through. Uh, I like this case because I did want to get a cooling fan put on my case, and with this case, the cooling fan will be on the inside of the case and thus protected by it. Now I also wanted to be able to add antennas to this case, or holes to, for attaching the antennas. So this one seemed to have plenty of room, so I thought that I have plenty of options for uh, where the antennas would be attached. Now I will say, when you take a look at mine, you can see that I ended up damaging it. Uh, and it got damaged because when I was drilling holes for the antennas, uh, I went down a little bit too hard and too fast with the drill press, and so that ended up damaging the case and caused some of the layers to start separating. Now this damage isn't major, I can still go ahead and fix this. Just have to find the right type of adhesive to get in place and then just hold it together with some clamps until it adheres. Uh, but even after drilling this hole, I found out where I was drilling the hole wouldn't work for me anyway because the sides of the case are kind of thick and with their thickness level, I would not be able to get the antenna all the way through the hole. Now for someone that decides to do this, it is still possible to do that if you were to get a drill bit that has a wider diameter to kind of uh, thin out uh, the case where you're putting uh, the hole and then go ahead and use a drill bit that has a smaller diameter for the actual hole through which the antenna is going to go. But I ended up making a change in plans. Instead of putting my antennas on the side, I decided to go ahead and put the antennas on the top. I found that the mesh was about was just a little larger than the diameter that I needed it to be for um, the hole for the antenna. So I went ahead and used my drill press to drill holes through there. Although I didn't so much drill holes through there as much as I did punch holes through there. Uh, what I found is that um, when I got this case printed out, the person that, print, that printed it for me, I'm not sure what setting that they used, but uh, the binding of the material around there was just a little bit weaker. So when I pressed down with the drill press, it actually just ended up punching out the fill from the 3D print and left a nice hex-shaped uh, hex hole, which for my purposes is perfectly fine. I went ahead and put the antennas on there. I did find that I had to go ahead and uh, tighten those with uh, a couple of needle nose pliers because if the antennas are not, or if the uh, bolt and the nut are not tightened enough, then every time you attach and detach the antenna, it'll make the antenna connector a little bit more loose. Uh, not something that I wanted to happen. But after I got everything in place, I was able to get the antennas attached and are attached pretty firmly. Uh, so 
I like this case, everything is working for me now. Um, so with this case, I'm able to take it with me to work and back every day, carry it inside of a bag, and so it doesn't get bumped or bruised um, too much. But with that, I have the NVIDIA Jetson all set up. And so the next thing to move on to is talking about getting a development environment set up. Now, in addition to doing a development environment on a Jetson Nano, I also want to have a development environment on my PC. So to be able to go back and forth between writing uh, code on my PC and writing code on the Nano. There are some environments where I might want to code where I just wouldn't be able to use a Jetson Nano. So to say if I'm on a long flight and I want to do some development. Uh, in that case, as long as I have a PC that has an NVIDIA GPU, it is possible to start doing some development with the cores. Your PC video adapter will probably have a different number of CUDA cores, but from a coding perspective, uh, it's all going to be the same. So that's it for this video. In my next video, I'll talk about getting the development environment set up on a PC and some other th things that you might want to do in a Jetson Nano itself in order to make the development environment that's there more fitting.